Hello again, everybody. I'm Scott Casper. That's Tony Hager, and this is Global Wrestling News. Well, the first ever Prowl preview event was held Friday night alongside the Freak Show Tournament in Las Vegas. More than 1,000 fans were in attendance to watch Team Titan Mercury take on the Finger Lakes Wrestling Club. Well, the duel started at 97 kilos. Dave Schultz Memorial champ Kale Byers stepped up and earned a 3-1 overtime victory against Finger Lakes Enoch Francois. This was my favorite match of the night, Scott. I mean, because they went to overtime, and there's new rules that were in place. No clock, just the first person to get a takedown. So these guys went back and forth, back and forth, and uh, they kind of got gassed, but Byers ultimately prevailed. And, uh, you know, the, his length, I think, is what his biggest asset was and how he uh, ended up winning this match. Would you like, you like that, no clock? No clock. I mean, that that's, it creates action. I mean, it, it puts pressure on that guy to score the, score the takedowns. So let's go to 74 kilos. Tight Mercury's Quentin Godley put on an offensive clinic and scored several different times. Single leg attack, 17-2, the win over Nestor to force. Surprising? Uh, you know, Godley had a tech fall over uh, him at the U.S. Open earlier, and, uh, you know, so this doesn't really surprise me. You know, what I did notice in this match was his size, and he is a monster at 74 kilograms, so maybe uh, to four, you know, he needs to maybe drop down a little weight, but uh, at the end of the day, I, I really think that uh, it was Godley's size that, uh, you know, impressed me at that. Godly, ungodly, big, and to four, perhaps undersized for the weight. Well, U.S. Open runner-up Andrew Hochstrasser trailed 2-0 early, but hit a huge second period takedown and a pair of turns to defeat returning Obi Blanc to score 8-2. You know, I was excited to see Obi Blanc back on the mat. You know, he, he served a two-year suspension, so uh, you know his quickness, his ability to score from his feet. That's uh, and Hochstrasser. I mean, he he is the uh, probably one of the top contenders to, to dethrone uh, Tony Ramos here. You know, once uh, once Hochstrasser got on top, I think he knew that he'd be able to control the match, and he did. He got the takedown late in the second uh, period, had a series of guts, and uh, it, it was over from there. Hochstrasser continues to improve as well. We're seeing it almost day by day. Yeah, I think he just needs to get a little tougher on his feet if he if he wants to uh, take down Ramos. And what I mean by that is he just he just has to get some toughness. He needs to be meaner against Tony Ramos. So if he does that, he'll, he'll have a shot to, to take him down to Iowa City. All right, well, let's talk about uh, the heavyweights. Wayne Boyd's favorite big man, Tyrell Fortune. He was named the outstanding wrestler with his huge 6-1 win over Justin Grant. I mean, you know, the, the, the score didn't uh, doesn't reflect the kind of action that happened on this match. It was kind of boring to me because Tyrell is just so tough from his feet. He is impossible to, to, for people to clear his hands. So there was a lot of push outs that happened. And, you know, if when, when Grant tried to take a shot, Tyrell just pancaked him and or, or launched him off the mat. So it was Tyrell all the way. 65 kilos, three-time Division Three national champion, Nazar Kolchinski ran out to a 10-1 lead, but ended up eking out an 11-10 win over Nate Carr. I remember back at the World Team Trials, it was Kolchinski who had a 7-0 lead against James Green, but ended up losing that bout. Tony, what's up with Nazar? I think Nazar is the most you know, unknown talent in the United States because he hasn't been able to finish the big matches. I mean, he beats James Green at the trials. I mean, where would he be? He would probably be a star just like James Green became here on the international circuit. You know, if he continues to dominate the match at being up 10 to 1 in this, uh, he gets the OW for me. But right now, you know, he just needs to focus on his stamina and his mat wrestling from the bottom position because if he, if he can't uh, be more defensive on the bottom, he's going to continue to get turned unless he, you know, keeps the foot on the gas from his feet. That's where, why they do the shark things. I mean, they've got to go 12, 15, 20 minutes on a go and be able to hang on to it if they're going to be able to compete in a match like this. When the intensity's on, you've got to have stamina to maintain. Yeah, I mean, he just, it, it kind of seemed like he put the foot off the gas in the second period, being up 10-1, he kind of just didn't want to score on, but that's not where he's the most, you know, powerful. That's not where he's, he's most effective, is he just has to go and not worry about the score. Well, we talked a little bit about upsets in Las Vegas. They seem to be frequent, but that's usually at the gaming table, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> the only real upset of the night on the wrestling mat came in the headline bout. That's where Austin Trotman downed Duran Wynn at 86 kilos. Wynn made it 5-3 late, but Trotman scored on a late counter takedown and won 7-3. 
Were you more surprised by Trotman or disappointed by Wynn? I would say just real disappointed with Wynn because we both picked him to, to win this bout. I mean, he signed a contract to fight down the road, and you know maybe he started training more towards you know his hand his hand fighting and boxing, and he just he looks slow on his tacks because he's usually really good at lowering his levels and hitting those doubles. So uh, we just didn't see that. He just seemed real uh, kind of defensive on his feet. So you know. Um, I thought Wynn would run away with it, but it was Trotman that really, you know, shocked me, and it was the shocker of the night. The biggest well, upset. Wynn looked, for sure, he looked off his game to me. He wasn't pulling the trigger as quickly as he normally does. So, all in all, I'd say it was a successful test event for the new Pro League, which is scheduled to kick off its official season this spring. Tony, who would you like to see headline that card? Uh, if they can pull it off, I mean, James Green versus Brent Metcalf, I mean, that would give us a good preview of what's to come in Iowa City here in a few months. Uh, Kyvin Gadsden versus Kyle Snyder. You know, that would tell us if Kyvin Gadsden is ready for the international circuit on freestyle, and uh, that would put some butts in the seats and silent a lot of critics for uh, Kyvin Gadsden. All right, well, our conversation will continue as you continue to tune in. When we come back, we'll hear from Hollywood Wayne Boyd about his event Friday night in Las Vegas. Stay tuned. All right, welcome back. It's time once again to send it over to Hollywood Wayne Boyd for this week's edition of As I See It. All right, thanks, Scott. And hey, Tony Hager, great seeing you out at the Prowl Meet in Vegas. We had a barn burner out there. It was good wrestling, solid. We had plenty of fans. Uh, we got the kids all around the match. If you happen to be watching Flo, you could have seen it. But Cale uh, uh, Byers, he goes uh, overtime with uh, Enoch Francois. Match goes into overtime. We had some scoring changes. We, we decided takedown wins in overtime, sudden death, kind of like from the old days. A lot of people said, gee, we got to stay with the uh, UWW rules, the, the old feel rules, and, and keep with the international rules. And I'm not sure I disagree with that. Like to hear from you folks about that. Some of the other matches, Hochstrasser and Obi Blanc. Obi Blanc was uh, tough. He came out, he was ahead four to nothing, then he went up four to one. But in the end, the conditioning and the strength and height of Hochstrasser won out. He won that match eight to four. Nate Carr and Nazar Kocheski went at it 11 to 10. Kocheski, that was a barn burner. At the heavyweight division, big Tyrell Fortune dominated Grant four to one. Interesting match, but Tyrell Fortune was in control the entire time. And Godley, he was the dominating wrestler out there. He looked as good as anybody on the mat. Quentin Godley. Titan Mercury won the first Prowl duel 11-2. It was two points for a decision, three points for 10 or more points in your win, and four points for a pin. There were no pins. A uh, couple other matches, interesting, uh, Austin Trotman upset uh, Duran Wynn at 86 kilos. Duran was a little out of shape, not quite as ready as he normally is. And last but not least, we had an interesting way we selected the outstanding wrestler. We brought the six winners from Prowl out, and we let the audience cheer for who their favorite was. The OW at the first Prowl, Tyrell Fortune. I think we'll see him a lot tougher in New York City at the New York AC tournament, which is turning out to be a great event. The Russians are coming. We got some big names there. Hochstrasser will be there. Perry will be there. I hear Ed Ruth is going to show up. Ed Ruth in New York City. Big matches there. Uh, Chris Berry, two-time national champ from Oklahoma State. He's ready for anybody and anybody that comes his way. Did anybody watch 3030, The Prince of Pennsylvania? Great, uh, great show on the whole DuPont, Dave Schultz situation where we had the movie Foxcatcher, but this thing ESPN did was very good. So if you're interested in commenting on any of this, everything going forward, please Twitter us at Titan underscore Mercury. We can talk, we can communicate, we can get in arguments, we can do anything you want, but keep watching, stay with Takedown TV. I'm Wayne Boyd. Scott, back to you and Tony. 
All right, thanks, Wayne. Always informative, energetic, and entertaining. Fans, I'm going to invite you to stick around. You continue to watch Global Wrestling News. All right, welcome back to GWN. We'll be joined shortly by a man who's been subscribing to Men's Health Magazine since high school. Well, now he's on the cover. That man, Adam Wheeler, joins us today. Adam, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, Adam. Congrats on not just making the cover, but you had to beat out five very talented individuals. How does that feel? Um, you know, it's an honor to be on the cover. Um, I'm not sure if you saw the magazine yet, but the cover that I'm on actually has the five contestants that made it to the top five. Um, they decided that what they told us is that it was a very hard decision for them um, who they were going to choose, so they ended up doing two covers. One was a collector's edition cover, and that's the one that I share the cover with with um, a couple other guys, the other four guys, which to me to be on the cover of a magazine that I started reading as a kid so I could learn how to work out and exercise and just live a healthy lifestyle and now you know to be part of it it's uh it's definitely an honor well you're no longer on the map but you still have a very intense kind of lifestyle how's your new career similar and yet different from wrestling um the difference between um i guess wrestling trying to make the olympic team versus something that i do now the swat team it's definitely a different world um but what I bring from my wrestling background into it is that you know we're on a team we train all the time I'm with a you know a group of guys who are like I'm not gonna say the elite of the department but you know the they're definitely very uh, high caliber guys on the police department so I get to be around you know kind of the same level of, of guys that I was at the training center where guys that are pushing me to be better in what I'm doing now um, and just being around that, that team environment and training for something that's new to me and learning and, and developing relationships with all these guys who I work so closely with, just kind of like the wrestlers, um, you know, I think it, it was an easy way for me to transition from athletics to a job that I love now. Well, for the people who are tuning in and maybe aren't familiar with your story, can you talk about your journey through the sport leading up to the 2008 Olympic Games? Yeah, um, you know, I didn't, if you know a little bit about my story, I didn't start out as a guy who was winning all my matches. Um, the same thing kind of happened to me in high school. I started wrestling in high school, which is, as you know, very late to begin a career in wrestling. And um, something about just not, I, you know, I was never good in, in wrestling my freshman and sophomore year in high school. Um, but something about that not being good kind of, gave me some type of desire, and I don't know where it came from or, or what, um, to become better and push myself to that point where I was one of the better guys, you know, in, in high school and the state of California at the time. The same thing kind of happened to me once I got to that Olympic level. Um, most people, not all, but a lot of people, probably most people, go to college first, where I went straight from being 18 years old out of high school to all of a sudden I'm wrestling guys you know, Olympic caliber national team guys and definitely taken my um, fair share of beatings for the first few years. But I think it, you know, it built character in me. And and um, again, for some reason, I just had that motivation to keep working hard at something, even though I wasn't being or wasn't successful at that point. Um, I just never quit and kept working hard at, at it. And eventually it paid off for me. A winner of the Ultimate Guy Contest in Men's Health Magazine, our guest, 2008 Olympic bronze medalist, Adam Wheeler. Adam, thanks for the time. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Well, you can watch the full interview at TakedownWrestle.com. Big thank you to our friends at Titan Mercury Wrestling Club, specifically Johnny. Thank you for helping to make that interview possible. Well, after the break, we're going to debate what's going on around the sport of wrestling. Imagine that. Hey, this is a uh, Global Wrestling News. Let's debate it.
Well, speaking of wrestling being in the limelight, ESPN ran the Prince of Pennsylvania, the 30 for 30 segment, just last week, and there are a lot of differences between the movie, Foxcatcher, and the real story. Foxcatcher and Prince of Pennsylvania, they, you know, they tell a story, but they're from different angles. Foxcatcher focused on the relationship between DuPont and Dave, why uh, the, the 30 for 30, you know, really focused on how crazy DuPont really was on the farm and on the compound. So uh, it was great to get that perspective. So which did you like better? I personally like the 30 for 30. It really, uh, you know, Foxcatcher, I didn't feel like it was an accurate portrayal of our sport. I felt like Mark Schultz really looked uh, dependent on DuPont when in reality it was DuPont that was dependent on them, on the wrestlers. You know, he had no one else in his life, and, th and that's what I, I found out from ESPN's uh, uh, documentary on them. Uh, you, you can't buy friendship. You can't buy happiness. So uh, that's, that's really what I thought the story was. Happiness at what price? My opinion for what it matters Foxcatcher at the end was a movie. It was one guy's idea of what the story looked like and his telling of it. I think perhaps we put too much expectation on the film Foxcatcher and stopped looking at it for what it really was, a vehicle, an entertainment vehicle, and somebody else's view looking in to the sport of wrestling. I, I agree. I think the sport thought they were going to get something, especially the ones that didn't actually know the story of Foxcatcher. You know, I, my, my wife saw it, and it was a, just very dark. And, and we were expecting somebody that, to showcase our sport, and we just we didn't get that with Foxcatcher. So I think some people were disappointed. But the 30 for 30, I think, told the story that the wrestlers really wanted to know. Well, the Mark Hall watch is still on, and a new team is in the hunt this weekend, right? Yeah, last week it was Nebraska that had all the buzz, you know, and now it seems to be switching focus to Arizona State. You know, there's a lot of great things happening um, out west for Zeke Jones. I mean, I can't imagine that he has any money left for Mark Hall, but uh, you know, Mark Hall is just a full-ride guy. So if somehow he can convince him or find the money to, to get him a scholarship, you know, uh, he would be a great fit for Arizona State. Well, the chance to train with Olympic hopefuls and former national team coach has got to be intriguing to Mark Hall. He's a real competitor. I mean, every program has Olympic hopefuls, and Mark can stay in the Midwest with coaches with current world team members and coaches that have been on Olympic teams. So I think he has that opportunity to, to wrestle with all those wrestlers anywhere he wants to go. So I think it's at the end of the day, Mark Hall is going to be a, a great athlete, but it's all going to be about where he feels comfortable, where he's going to see his time being uh, you know, most useful and the most fun and, and preparing him for the international circuit after college. Well, you'll find most of Mark's teams, the ones he's visited and the ones he's considering, on Intermat's preseason rankings. One of those teams, Minnesota, they barely cracked the top 25, but the Gophers, so they're on a downward trend or just changing. This weekend, we're going to have both Zeke Jones and Jay Robinson on our next edition of Takedown Radio. We hope you tune in live or you can tune in to the rebroadcast of that show. What are your thoughts about Minnesota? I mean, Minnesota lost half of their lineup. Uh, you know, they lost the Dardane brothers, uh, Dylan Ness, Logan Storley, uh, Scott Schiller. You know, uh, who, that was arguably the best class that Minnesota's ever had in history. I mean, tough guys to lose. No, 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 no. Let's not say history. I mean, his, that's a strong word, dude. There's a lot of All-Americans in that list right there that uh, built a foundation. And, and I, I think this is going to be an off year, but, you know, there's... There's going to be some people to fill those gaps. And, you know, if they do, I think then you'll maybe see them creep into the rankings. But right now they're untested. So the, the people that do these rankings don't know how they will perform at the D1 level yet. All right, Minnesota has a history with uh, success with big guys. I mean, let's face it, the last couple of years we've been able to watch some incredible heavyweights in the country, mostly led by Nelson from Minnesota. What can we expect from Michael Krolls? He, he bursted onto the scene last year. He outperformed his seat at Big Tens, NCAAs. He got eighth at uh, the national championship. So, you know, anyone that makes All-American status at this weight class has an opportunity to, I think, win uh, the, the heavyweight weight class. So, um, you know, it's, it's really just going to depend on Minnesota developing into that heavyweight that they've always had. So eighth place, eighth place finish. Yeah, it's great, but they want somebody that's going to be up in that top four. Are you surprised to see Penn State at number one? Yeah, I know. When it was announced that uh, they were going to sit Nico and Zane, you know, I, I knew that they would be the one number one team going into this season. I mean, Nico and Zane, they are they're title contenders. So anytime you can add two title contenders to your team in the lineup, you're going to be a favorite. Those, those are big numbers that are going to be coming in New York City. 
Drew Periano has been let go at Northwestern, and it's a little puzzling given his track record. You know, something has to be going on behind the scenes. I mean, Jay Borchel left, and then they lost uh, Michik, who, who is a big prospect and somebody that I saw bursting on the scene at that 125-pound weight class. I mean, the, the season just got started two weeks ago, so it's, it is puzzling to, to see that they let him go. I think he was an outstanding coach, but Matt Storniello, who's been tapped to take his place, at least on an interim basis, has been on the staff for six seasons. i got to believe the program is in capable hands. Oh, definitely, and, and I think, you know, he's been there for six years, so he knows what Drew had. So, again, you know, we, we got to get to the bottom of why he was let go. I mean, hopefully we can get to that here in the coming weeks. We'll bring that story to you. You know, uh, Drew just brought in a lot of top ten recruiting classes. He had his team in the top 10 and, and not a wrestler that we all know, Jason Sirs is a national champ as a freshman. So it, it's going to be interesting to see what details come out um, here in the coming weeks. Fans, we're out of time for our executive producer, Andrew F. Barth, our producer, Hollywood Wayne Boyd, and Tony Hager. I'm Scott Casper. And from Studio 3B, we'll see you next week right here on Global Wrestling News.